Hello again, everybody. This is Pastor Tony, and welcome to lesson number 29. Yeah, we only have a couple of lessons left in this series we've entitled The Better Covenant. And again, we could call it the far, far, far better covenant. And that is referring to the new covenant that we live in as believers, new born again believers in Christ. And uh, we've just covered so much territory here. We could spend a lot longer on this series, I could tell you. But I believe we're getting a good picture, a good uh, idea of the distinction between the old covenant or the Mosaic law and the new and better covenant that we have in Christ. Whereas the old covenant all pointed to Jesus in types and shadows, the new covenant is all about Jesus all about his finished work and all about the realities and the substance these he, he has brought to the table for all of us. Now, in these last two lessons, I really want to cover an aspect of this new and better covenant. Actually, we could say a result of this new and better covenant that uh, the Lord brings to the table for all of us. And uh, so we'll, let's go back over to the book of Hebrews again today. Now, we've been in the book of Hebrews throughout this entire uh, series here and uh, we found out that it was written to a group of believers who came in on, on the right thing they were born again they were taught correctly to begin with about justification by faith about having faith in Jesus and Jesus finished work alone and in his shed blood but then they got off and they somebody came in and said all right you're gonna have to go back and mix in the old with the new and uh, that's gonna make everything good and hunky-dory and better and perfect. Uh, and that's why they get such a, uh, a, a real harsh uh, correction in this letter about leaving the perfect, leaving the complete, leaving the new and better covenant in Christ, and then rever re reverting back to types and shadows and reverting back to the works of the flesh again. See, that's never going to mix and never going to work. And so they get a, a good dose of a comparison between the Old Covenant Law of Moses and this New Covenant that we have in Christ. And the result is an astounding. We have a far, far better covenant established on better promises, better realities, better everything. And the reason is, it's because of Jesus. It's because of Him and His finished work and what uh, He has brought to the table for all of us that's what makes this a whole different ball game, a whole radically new and better covenant for us. But we're going to look at the subject of faith. Now, I teach on faith a lot, but you can't just talk about faith, uh, and you can't just talk about just the mechanics of faith and the and the uh, you know uh, different aspects of faith. We need to find out where the root of our faith is. And we're going to find out that Jesus brought to the table for all of us under this new covenant a better covenant, a better us, a better faith, I should say. Now, here in Hebrews chapter 11, Hebrews the 11th chapter, of course, it begins first three verses of Hebrews chapter 11, and it reads, Now faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of of things not seen. So he's telling us what faith is all about. It's all about substance. It's not about pie in the sky, fantasy world, make believe, you know, hit and miss. It's all about substance and it's all about the substance of things hoped for or expected, the evidence of things not seen. Now notice again there's evidence of things in, that are not seen. Just because it's not seen doesn't mean it's not real, okay? And again, we're not talking about uh, Magic Kingdom, Fantasy World, Make Believe, those kind of things. We're talking about realities in the spiritual realm. Now, verse number two, it says, For by it the elders obtained a good testimony. Now, he's talking about the elders, meaning the patriarchs, those that came before us in the Old Covenant. And not just under the Mosaic Law, but throughout from the beginning all the way through up into that time of Jesus. But verse 3 says, By faith we understand that the worlds were framed by the word of God, so that the things which are seen were not thing made of things which are visible. So notice right here that it begins with 
faith, and it talks about God is the originator of our faith. It, God is origin. It, it's His idea. He's the originator of all faith. He used His faith to create something out of the spiritual unseen realm to in the material realm. So we see that faith, the faith of God, is actually a bridge that bridges the gap between the unseen spiritual realm where God abides and this seen realm, this natural realm, this physical realm that we abide. And so it manifests things in the natural realm that actually originated in the spiritual realm from God. But again, notice that faith is a God thing. It's not something that you know he expects out of us and you know and, and hopefully just go muster up some faith and hope you got you're going to have faith to make it no no this all this is this is god's faith this is his idea this is what he used to create the heavens and the earth now it goes on in verse number six it reads but without faith it is impossible to please him for he who comes to god must believe see believing is part of the new covenant Whereas self-work, self-effort, self-faith, uh, I guess we could say, were part of the old covenant, law of Moses, the new covenant is all about believing. So he who comes to God must believe that he is, not just he is existing, but he is everything that we need. He is anything and everything we need. He is our Savior, our Redeemer. He's our righteousness. He's our healer, our provider. He is uh, our, our victory, everything. He is everything we need. So we must believe that God is and that he is a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. So notice we must believe that God is Savior, but he rewards with salvation. He is healer, but he rewards with healing in our, in our life. But notice it's all, again, about faith. This whole thing is about faith. It's about the faith of God. Now he goes through uh, Hebrews chapter 11. I like to call it the Hall of Fame of Faith. And he lists different individuals, both uh, male and female, men and women, under the Old Covenant, uh, who God did something in or through by faith. Through faith. So in other words, all of these, it all starts with that one phrase, by faith. Not by works. See, by works would be Old Covenant Law of Moses by faith is indicative, first of all, of the Abrahamic covenant that preceded this one, and it's all about the new covenant that we live in in Christ today. So uh, skip on down there to the last couple of verses here in uh, Hebrews chapter 11. Hebrews 11, let's look at verses 39 and 40. He goes, goes through all these people who by faith did something or God did something in or through them that was all supernatural is all miraculous something over their own heads over the natural realm but then in verse 39 and 40 it reads and all these having obtained a good testimony through faith did not receive the promise so they all had a good testimony through faith they all lived and walked and and abided did these things through faith but they did not receive the actual promise. In other words, they were still living under those types and shadows, looking ahead to Jesus. Their faith was in the becoming Messiah and what he would do. But verse number 40, it says, God having provided something better for us. Now, who is the us? It's those who are under the new covenant. We're all inclusive. Now, notice that God provided something better for us as new covenant believers that they, under the Old Covenant, should not be made perfect apart from us. So again, I want you to see here that all the things that God was able to do in their lives, through them, for them, was all by faith, but they were still living as Old Covenant believers, under types and shadows, looking forward to the Messiah. But now he says, God has provided something better for us. See, that word better keeps coming up over and over again, and it appears here in the Hall of Fame of Faith chapter as well. That actually, no matter what they did by faith, we have something better. We have a better faith based on better promises, based on a better Messiah, a better sacrifice, a better blood than they had. That's why everything is better for us. See, where they had promises 
that of the Messiah to come and what he would bring, we're living under the fulfillment of those promises, the reality and the substance of those promises today in Christ Jesus. Jesus fulfilled the promises, the types and shadows. He completely fulfilled the law for us to the dotting of the I, crossing of the T. And now we're living as a new covenant believer under these better realities and these better things. And so therefore, our faith ought to respond and we ought to have a better faith. So go over to uh, Hebrews chapter 12. He kind of carries the same thought on. Again, uh, the books in the Bible originally weren't written in chapter and verse. Thank God we have those. That's a reference for us. But here in Hebrews chapter 12, verse 1, it says, Therefore, we also, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses. Now, he's talking about the witnesses, the people under the old covenant. He says, we are surrounded by this great cloud of witnesses. He said, let us lay aside every weight and the sin which so easily ensnares us. And let us run with endurance the race that is set before us. So he's saying, all right, we're surrounded by all these great cloud of witnesses. We've got something better in store for us. Let us lay aside every weight and the sin. Now notice it's a specific sin he's talking about. He's not talking about, you know, this little root over here, this branch over here. He's actually talking about the mother of all of it. Uh, the root sin. The sin that has ensnared, trapped, and tripped up mankind since the beginning, since the Garden of Eden. What is that sin? Well, the one that he's been dealing with throughout this book of Hebrews, it is the sin of self-centeredness and self-righteousness. See, when men get themselves on their mind and they get the focus of their faith on them, on self, what self can do, what self can work out, what self can provide, what self can achieve and earn, then we got our eyes on the wrong thing. We're always, our faith is always going to come up short like we do, like self does. But so notice right here, he's, he said, let us lay aside that. And he's telling, he's telling the group of believers here, going back to that self-centered, self-righteous system right there. Uh, he's saying, you got to wait, lay that, that weight aside. You got to put that sin that does so easily in snares. You got to put, a, put that thing away from you once and once for all. Why? Because we don't need to uh, try to perform and and try to earn a self-righteousness. We need to receive, believe, and receive for His righteousness. See, that's what the new covenant's all about. God doing something for us that we could not do for ourselves. Again, Romans 4.17 says, Those who receive the abundance of grace and the free gift of righteousness will reign as kings in life. Now, look at verse number two. He said, looking unto Jesus. All right, so we've seen all of these great patriarchs of old. They are, they are to be honored. They are to be revered. But they did things under types and shadows, under an inferior covenant. But notice, he says, looking unto Jesus, the author and the finisher of our faith who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and has sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. So in other words, as great as Abraham was, Moses was, Noah was, Rahab, all these other people who did something by faith, we're, we got something better. We're to look to Jesus today. He is the captain of our salvation. He is the author and the finisher of our faith. He is the originator of this new covenant faith, and he's the developer of this faith, the finisher of this faith that we're talking about. But it requires us looking to him, looking away from, you know, one translation says, I think it's amplified, it says looking away from all that will distract unto Jesus. I like that translation. Because when it just says looking unto Jesus, you've got to look away from everything else. What is the biggest distraction of mankind throughout that's kept us from walking in this kind of faith, walking in the supernatural, walking in the things of God, and receiving and enjoying those benefits and blessings? It's the fact that we've had to focus on something else, and most of the time it was on us. 
it was on self, it was on man, it was on some kind of a system of works and performance where we did things and then God, we earn a paycheck and then God responds to us by giving us a blessing or a benefit as a result of that. Well, that's not the way this works at all. We've really established this. The new covenant works only on grace. What Jesus has already earned, achieved, provided for us in his finished work and what we receive, and that's where our faith responds. Faith is not, it doesn't twist God's arm. It doesn't, it doesn't make God move on your behalf. Actually, faith is a responder. But see, legalistic man have that, that completely reversed. They're, they're thinking if they do enough stuff, then God will respond to them and then give them something. Well, that's not the way this works. Jesus has already done it. God has already provided it all. Now we respond to his finished work. We respond to that grace with our faith, and then we receive, believe and receive what he's already done. And see, that's what makes our faith that much greater. So he said, looking unto Jesus, the author and the finisher of our faith. And then it describes, you know, who for the joy set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and has sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. So actually, this faith is Jesus' faith. The, the faith that he originates and finishes, develops and finishes in our life is his own faith. And we see that his faith caused him to overcome. His faith caused him to make it. His faith caused him to do something no other person in the Old Covenant could do. And that is to overcome sin and death. And see, that's where our faith is. Why? Because our faith is in him. But it requires us focused on Jesus and him alone. Not on us, not us in the mix somewhere, but in Jesus and in his finished work. He is the author and the finisher of our faith because he is the author and the finisher of our salvation, of our redemption. And everything we have in this new covenant is all based on him. None of it is based on you. See, faith is the, the, the key term and the key ingredient for living a successful new covenant life as a believer. Now, we're going to see this kind of played out in the Gospel of Mark. Now, this was uh, not too long right before Jesus went to the cross. But uh, this kind of describes this, and I, I believe this story is recorded in, um, in just about all the other Gospels. So this is a real key thing right here we need to focus on. And uh, it, it, we're going to see this kind of played out, what I'm talking about right here. And there's kind of a changing of the guards between the old and the new that's taking place right here, begins to take place here. Now, Mark chapter 9, verse number 2, it describes this story, and we'll just read it on down. It says, Now after six days, Jesus took Peter, James, and John, and led them up on a high mountain apart by themselves. And he was transfigured before them. So he took his inner circle, Peter, James, and John. They went up on this high mountain. And right in front of them, he was transfigured. Now, what, what happened there? Something on the inside of Jesus that was there all along began to manifest and de be demonstrated on display outwardly where they could actually see it. Now, verse 3 says, His clothes became shining exceedingly white like snow such as no launderer on earth can whiten them. So it even affected this light of that glory that was just exploding on the outside of Jesus and manifesting, even affect his, his natural appearance, even his own clothes. that made him so, so bright and white, it looked like snow. So verse 4, And Elijah appeared to them with Moses. <laughs> and they were talking... With Jesus so if this didn't blow their mind enough right here seeing you know what was happening with Jesus right in front of them on this mountain then all of a sudden they look and there's Elijah and Moses now who were Elijah and Moses where well, they're the key representatives of the Old Covenant law of Moses what we call the Old Covenant they were uh, you know Elijah was the executor of the law of Moses. Moses was the hand by which God gave uh, the law or instituted the law. So we see the two main representatives 
uh, of the old covenant there talking with Jesus. Now, how did they know that? Well, you know, I guess it's just a spiritual recognition. I, I think there's some kind of spiritual recognition where they, they knew who they were, even though they didn't have pictures or video or anything like that. They knew these were men of renown and they knew something about there, there was a recognition that took place supernaturally, spiritually, where they knew they were, uh, they were Elijah and Moses. They were talking with Jesus. And you know their mind was just being blown right here. So notice here the spokesman, the self-appointed spokesman of the group in verse number five. It says, Then Peter answered and said to Jesus, <laughs> this is almost comical to me, he said, Rabbi, it is good for us to be here. He couldn't think of anything else to say. So he just said to Jesus, yeah, it's really good for us to be here. <laughs> you know, and you know, that was harmless right there. If he would have just left it there and put a period at the end and then shut his mouth. But then he goes on to say, and let us make three tabernacles, one for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah. Uh-oh, uh, you know, at this point, God's not going to leave this one alone because you said, what, what's the problem with that? You know, that sounds like a noble, good thing. Well, the problem is, and Peter unknowingly did this, is he put Jesus and the new covenant on the same level as Moses and Elijah under the old covenant. He put Jesus on the same level as them, and you can't do that. And he put the new covenant on the same level as as the old covenant. Now again, if the new covenant is far better than the old covenant, this it must be on a higher plane, must be more valuable. It, it must have, have greater honor attached to it. Now again, why is that? Is it because we're here? No, it's because Jesus is there. He's in the center of this thing. So he says, and let us make three tabernacles, one for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah. He's probably proud of himself for coming up with that, but you know, he just didn't know what he was saying. And so, you know, God was not going to leave this alone at this point. Verse 6, it says, because he did not know what to say, for they were greatly afraid. He just kind of opened his mouth and blurted it out. Verse 7, and a cloud overshadowed them, and a voice came out of the cloud saying, this is my beloved son, hear him. Now, I want you to see that right there, that this is God the Father all of a sudden interrupting Peter's speech and what he just said. He was not going to leave that alone. And he boomed out of heaven with this great manifestation of glory and this, this cloud and this big voice. It boomed and it says, this is my beloved son, hear him. Now I want you to see that the whole new covenant is based on Jesus the son. And notice he said, hear him. He didn't say hear them. He did not put the old covenant on the same level as the new. He didn't put Elijah and Moses as great as they are and as great as they were on the same level as his son. So he said, this is my beloved son, hear him. Verse eight, and then suddenly, when they had looked around, they saw no one anymore, but only Jesus themselves. See, this is this was a changing of the guard, so to speak. This is the changing of the guards between the old giving way to the new. Between Elijah, Moses, all those great patriarchs of the old covenant that are honored, that are revered, they're giving way though in submitting to Jesus the Son of the living God, the Messiah, the Redeemer, the Savior. See, there's only one, there's only room for one Savior in this one category of Savior, and that's Jesus, not anybody else. And so we have to see that distinction. See, again, we're seeing the distinction between the old and the new. It's important for your faith that you see the difference here, and you live according to the new and you live according to these principles that God established here on the Mount of Transfiguration. First of all, he said, this is my beloved son, hear him. And then in verse number eight, he said, suddenly when they had looked around, they saw no one anymore, but only Jesus with themselves. So hear him only, see him only. Looking unto Jesus, looking away from all things that would distract unto Jesus, the author and the finisher of our faith. And see, that's what makes faith real. That's what makes your faith strong. This is what's going to cause your faith to be developed. You know, thank God we don't just have to have that, that just undeveloped faith we started out with. Our faith can be developed. 
In fact, it can be developed to the faith of Jesus himself. Yes, it can. <laughs> We're going to go through some scripture. We're going to see this. How, how Jesus is introducing this new life of supernatural, greater faith. And this is where it began right here. This is where the changing of the guard, this is where everything began to change and transform. That it's all about Jesus. Our faith is focused on Jesus. Hear him, see him only. Now, we're going to go to Galatians chapter 2. We couldn't get a lesson in without going to Galatians, right? But we've looked at this one before. But let's look at this verse in light of what we've just said today. Galatians chapter 2 and verse 20. It said, I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me. Now notice the I that he's talking about who no longer lives was the old I. The old one that came, the old I that came from the, uh, from the first Adam was one of his descendants. That's where sin, that's where condemnation, guilt, shame, that's where all these things entered the picture. But notice right here, that man was crucified on the cross with Jesus. See, 2 Corinthians 5.17 says that, Behold, if there is anyone in Christ, he is a new creation. All things have passed away, and all things are new, and all things are of God. See, if you're going back and just revisiting who you were without Christ, if you don't see yourself in Christ, then your faith is not going to be developed any more than that, that initial new birth experience. Thank God for that if that's all you ever get, but you don't have to stop there. But how is your faith going to be developed? How is it going to be how is it going to become a stronger, more pure faith? It's when we begin to look at ourselves in Christ. Not seeing ourselves apart from Him, but seeing ourselves in Him. Then it goes on to say, and the life which I now live in the flesh. See, there's a new I. That's the new creation. That's the one that's in Christ. See, the old one, crucified, dead, buried, he had all of that, all of that old man attached to the first Adam and the fall of man. That died, was buried, and he did not resurrect. The resurrection that happened to Jesus and us is all a new creation, a new man, and new things that are of God. So he says, in the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. Other translations read it this way, and I think it can read, I think it should read this way. The life which we now live in the flesh, we live by the faith of the Son of God who loved us and gave himself for us. So it's not your faith that you have to muster up. It's Jesus' own faith that he authored, that he knows how to finish, but we need to hear him only and see him only. That is indicative of New Covenant lifestyle. Well, that's all the time I've got for this lesson. Join us again for the last lesson, Lesson 30, as we continue on this, one, this thought pattern here on faith, and I believe you're going to be blessed. If you need additional materials and resources, you can always visit us on the web, TonyCowan.org, and we will see you in the next lesson. Hey guys, thank you so much for checking out this video. We hope that it really blessed you. Hope you got a lot out of it. Make sure that you subscribe to our YouTube channel. Make sure you also turn on the notifications so that you get notified whenever we post a new video. Also, go ahead and hit that like button. And if God's doing awesome things in your life like we're believing Him for, then we would love for you to share that with us. So leave us a comment. Let us know all the good things God's doing in your life. We'll see you next time.